Hello everyone, today we talk about Vlad the Third, Voivode of Wallachia, better known as Vlad the Impaler, Vlad Tsepes in Romanian, or also Vlad Dracula, and we will explain now all the onomastics, right? Uh, a figure that is considered, in fact, one of the most important rulers in Wallachian history, was also made a national hero of Romania, and that is somehow uh, connected, uh, to say the least, with the more, uh, even more popular, at least as far as the literature goes, figure of Count Dracula by Bram Stoker in this Victorian horrid novel, uh, loosely inspired uh, to the historical figure. Uh, in some aspects it would be interesting to comment on it, if it wasn't for the fact that today's video sticks just to the historical figure uh, and that we can deal with uh, in another in another video just because I'm actually a fan um, of the book, of the story actually I, I, and I, I don't like horror uh, in general but ever since I was a child I had something for uh, Count Dracula it's one of the single most uh, appreciated uh, genres because just generally I don't like fantasy this is also why I, I I like history, but whenever there is a folkloristic sort of uh, historically based and also deep um, anthropological meaning from fiction, I appreciate. I uh, made videos even about book reviews uh, based on occultism and stuff like that. Um, but what I always say, watching uh, a movie, reading a book, uh, playing a video game, do not stick to, say, the, the criticism of historical accuracy, at least as such. Um, evaluate the artistic value proper um, of, of the work, right? Because from there, right, the, the, the big failures, the, the big disappointments actually stem also f and generally from a deeper misunderstanding of what even fiction could express about uh, a, certain, uh, a certain topic, uh, historical or not, but still are real enough for us to care. Uh, as you know, I don't make biographies uh, more than much. This could be uh, a beginning of it. Um, I will not explain the reasons why it's, that it's the case um, yet. Um, and this topic choice, you know, fell obviously uh, on, say, Halloween as a sort of uh, special. But, um, of course, I made a video about the foundation of Malachi, as a matter of fact, um, we surely look at figures like Mircea the Elder uh, and more, because uh, it's really an area that deserves a lot of attention and get really lots of views um, from uh, medieval Romanian history, which I'm glad, right? Because evidently either there aren't uh, enough out there, or you know, at least I uh, fulfill at least part of my job here. Um, in any case, let's really get down to the thing. First and foremost, uh, onomastics, right? Um, it's important to understand where the so the house of Dracula comes from, right? Because we know of the name Dracula, right? Which we again associate mostly to the to the fictional uh, vampire, um, but this was actually for century already, and this is in fact also where Bram Stoker took it from, the actual nickname of Vlad III, Voivode of Wallachia, not of Transylvania. As we will see, actually, uh, Vlad uh, Tsepes was quite connected with Transylvania, he was, he was, he was likely born, by the way, but he was Wallachian, of course. And we are told, right, in the diplomatic reports of the time, popular uh, tales, etc., of of different spellings. But by, by the way, it's Dracula with C then Draculia, uh, G L A I, uh, in the end, or Dracula with K. Already from the 15th century, and we'll understand why. Because the same Vlad signed himself as properly Draculia, spelled with uh, G L Y A, uh, or himself um, Dracul. Yeah, so just with, with a K instead, um, at least uh, in the from the late 70s of the 15th century, right? Um, 
D name is fundamentally the Slavonic genitive form of Dracu, that is dragon in Romanian. And this was essentially a patronymic that meant of the dragon, right? Given that Vlad's father, his homonymous Vlad II, voivode of Wallachia, uh, was, had been nicknamed, in fact, Vlad the Dragon uh, himself, as he had joined the um, monarchical chivalry order right, of the dragon, right, selected only for the higher aristocracy and monarchs, right, founded uh, back in the day, 1408, by Emperor Sigismund, um, who was then the king of Hungary, right, and thus, as we've seen also recently uh, in the video about uh, medieval Transylvania, so ruling on substantial part of the areas that the House of Draculashti also did, Right in the video about many of the foundation of Wallachia, you understand that the Hungarians had somehow always um, tried to to Germanize um, the area also south of the Carpathians that had brought, uh, that had witnessed the the, uh, the political compaction on this um, on the base of this Romance uh, people that um, we we have also explained the origins of um, historically. All right, so. Um, Dracula or Dragule would stand there as, uh, you know, the son of the dragon, right? Referred to Vlad the Second, and interestingly enough, and also in part for, as we'll see now, the Black Legion on Vlad that existed from different sources already at the time. Dracul means the devil, right? Uh, in so the modern Romanian. Uh, contributed and, you know, was influenced in, say, um, in the definition of Vlad's uh, reputation uh, due to the analogy. Um, the term Vlad Sepesh, so the impaler, uh, is uh, a nickname we, that we find in Romanian historiography for the um, atrocities that Vlad committed, as we'll see now. And the nickname, of course, referred to the practice of impalement. That was something that fundamentally Vlad learned. Well, it was pretty universal in some way, but his experience, especially as an Ottoman hostage, had quite a, you know, quite an effect on him. Um, there, there are also from the 16th century um, so as early as that, both or historians uh, and and not calling Vlad, in fact, the impaler. For example, uh, Tursun Beg, an Ottoman bureaucrat and historian, wrote a chronicle dedicated to Mehmet II. That, as we will see, had you know quite a, um, a role in, in Vlad's life. It was, this was the conqueror of Constantinople in 1453, called. Um, the um, Vlad Kazikli Voivoda, that is to say, the Impaler Lord, right in Turkish. We are essentially at the turn of the of the century, like from between the 15th and 16th. Um, Mircea the Shepherd, that was a later Voivode of Wallachia, just like Vlad the Third tries, as we will see, for all the sort of political instability that followed, and we are essentially in the mid-16th century, used the same impaler nickname when referring to his predecessor in a letter grant uh, dating to 1551. So, just looking a bit at the early life of Vlad, he was the second legitimate son of the voivode of Wallachia, Vlad II, also known as Vlad Dracul, Dra the Dragon. He had ruled from 1436 to 1442 in this office, and from 1443 to 1447. Um, he was himself actually an illegitimate son of the great ruler of Wallachia, Mircea the Elder, right, that had ruled um, uninterruptedly as such from 1386 until his death in 14. Uh, 18, 
right? Uh, and Vlad the second won, as we've seen, his Draco um, nickname from having joined this Order of the Dragon that was designed also, in fact, to keep fundamentally the uh, the Ottomans out of, of Europe. Um, it had a deep meaning, say, in a um, in, in this context, right, fundamentally it spread primarily in Germany uh, and Italy, um, but it somehow declined in Western Europe and it continued to play an important role in countries like Hungary, Serbia and Romania, exactly because of this um, Turkish um, the, 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 the mobilization against the Turkish threat that, as we'll see now, was quite in common, especially for Wallachia that was just in front of um, of the Ottoman territories south of the Carpathians um, and so somehow aside from the Danube in between just uh, 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 through an open way we don't know much about Vlad III's early life actually not even when he was born precisely uh, but since he was old enough in 1448 uh, as a candidate for the throne of Wallachia we think that he was born between 1428-31 and more likely in 1429 precisely after his father settled in Transylvania it's speculative right but uh, it's a significant likelihood just as the fact that we even would know his uh, place of birth that is Sekishoara uh, it's a municipality on the Tirnava Mare River in the Muresh country, so in, properly in, in the um, in the Carpathian heartland, uh, a Transylvanian Saxon town. As a matter of fact, in just recently I made a video about uh, uh, this topic, so you can find in the Romanian history playlist. Um, and in this town, his father had a three-story house living in from 1431 to 1435 that you can still see in the main square of uh, Sigishoara right and uh, we do not know exactly uh, who Vlad's mother was right she was likely a daughter a kinswoman of Alexander the uh, first voivode of Moldavia also known as Alexander the good who ruled and made a video about medieval Moldavia uh, between uh, the line between 1400 and 1432 all right and he was essentially the ruler who initiated a series of reforms um, to also consolidate the status of the principality um, and so we're talking about the highest uh, nobility essentially of of this era between the Balkans central and eastern Europe it's also possible, however, that uh, Vlad's mother was not related to Alexander I, but that she had been Vlad II's first wife, right? Uh, so Vlad II uh, had seized uh, the control of the Wallachian voivodeship uh, after the death of his half-brother, Alexander I Aldea. We are in 1436. Uh, this guy had been ruling um, Wallachia uh, since 1431, right? He was the legitimate son of Mircea the Elder, coming to rule in one of the single most traumatically violent and brutal times in Wallachian history. Um, and I will not digress on you know what the reality of Wallachia specifically was, but just in term, quite concrete terms, like imagine uh, the local nobility fighting constantly against one another and this, this dramatic pressure at the outskirts of major powers like the Ottomans, um, Hungary, and with all the possible intrigues that, as we will see, mark also Vlad III's uh, rule. Um, one of Vlad II's charters issued on January the 20th, 1437, mentions for the first time in at least documentable history at, at this point, Vlad III, together with his elder brother, Mircea, that would be, as we will see now, Mircea II, Voivode, Prince of 
of Wallachia. And um, Vlad mentioned the two sons as his firstborn, right? They were mentioned in four further documents in the next couple of years, and the last of these um, refers also to their younger brother that would become, would, was Radu, would become Radu the uh, third of, of Wallachia, also known as the handsome, right? Uh, and uh, after a meeting with John Hunyadi, right, his leading Hungarian military and political figure, um, that was also region of uh, the Hungarian to the Hungarian kingdom, and that was at the time voivode of Transylvania, because that's also where the Hunyadis, by the way, came from. Uh, and um, again, made some videos about Transylvania, but also about Balkan heraldry. We talked about certain symbolism, even the werewolves, uh, the the, the Balakian crow. There is really a lot about those primitive ancestral beast warrior traditions um, among the this. This, this populations uh, in the Balkans in Central Europe uh, at this time, right? And it's quite instructive to, to look at that. Um, so Uniadi was like the, the big shot of the situation uh, in the region. Um, the Wallachians were not as strong as Hungary. Um, and essentially, Vlad II at that point had um, granted Uniadi not to support an Ottoman invasion of Transylvania in March 1442 because that's what the situation was like the Lachians, again the, were the most exposed to the Ottomans that had essentially forced them into some degree of submission for which they wanted a recognition so much so that the very Ottoman Sultan Murad II uh, ruling uh, from 1421 to 1444 and again from 46 to 51, ordered Vlad II to come to Gallipoli to demonstrate his loyalty. Right. So on that occasion, Vlad and his younger brother Radu, right, not um, Mirsa that was essentially the the heir, um, presumptive at that point, um, ac accompanied their father to the Dardanelles um, in Ottoman territory and on that occasion they were imprisoned by the Turks that essentially took them as hostages to secure Wallachian obedience. In fact while the same Vlad II was captured he was also released right and his two younger sons um, Vlad and Radu remained hostages um, to, to the Ottomans, an experience that quite affected them, right? They were held imprisoned in the fortress of um, Dogrugots, right, uh, near uh, Iconium. So we're talking the An Anatolian interland, right? Um, this is expressed by the contemporary Ottoman chronicles. Uh, these were tough times because this was a way, of course, for the Ottomans to co-opt um, the Balkan uh, establishment uh, to render them more obedient, to, to acquaint them essentially with the, um, the practice and theory of Ottoman, of Ottoman rule. But, of course, it was not just uh, a, simple, um, a simple stay. Um, there were lots of intrigues, um, lives, uh, you know, Taken, including the one of um, a lover of Vlad, who was torn apart uh, in front of him, right, by the Ottomans. Um, and this is, you know, the kind of thing, just imagine you have your own girlfriend cut to pieces in front of your, your eyes. And if you look at um, Vlad's life, as we will do today, you realize that, uh, you know, certain things in terms of payback were motivated just by, not just by this, but by the general humiliation, right, of this um, Islamic power coming to dictate rule to these peoples that obviously were just at this point trying to, to affirm their own, uh, their own uh, national identities, their own political 
uh, autonomies and that were quite also warlike in their own regard. He will talk more about Balkan history. Um, Vlad and uh, Radu's lives were definitely in danger during the exile because um, again they were thought also to, to maintain contacts with home and a lot of spy games etc. Especially since Vlad II, Dracul, at home had forged a new alliance with uh, especially the king of Poland, Vladislas III, right? It was also the one of Hungary, but, you know, controlled definitely better just his uh, original kingdom. Made lots of videos explaining essentially this dynamic of dynastic um, sums of the various central European kingdoms and there is a lot of dynamic there but uh, as we've seen also for Moldavian history because Poland was acting a bit like that mostly also against um, the strongest Hungarian rulers the wanting instead to control these other regions um, supporting uh, that and um, essentially trying to make them client states against the the Ottomans Right, and this was happening, by the way, just when the same, the same Vladislav was mounting, in fact, the uh, up the, the Crusade of Barna, right? Uh, that, as you know, also it ended in disaster, in 1444, uh, as just the one of Nicopolis, uh, half a century before. Uh, did right and again we can't digress simply on all these various events also because Vlad was was in Turkey at this point so it, it's of just contextual importance to, to mention right but it's obvious that at this point the Ottoman Valachian relations were not particularly uh, good to say the least um, and Vlad II was to, to act like this right even if Two of his sons were in hostage in Anatolia, in Turkish hands, because it was just a good occasion and it was possible to reinforce Valachian position internationally had the crusade succeeded, which wasn't the case. Um, in fact, Vlad believed after the defeat of Varna that the Turks would have soon slaughtered uh, his children, right, for the sake of, say, uh, Christian peace, as he said himself. However, um, after the Valachian rebellion against the Ottomans, nor Vlad nor Rad were killed, nor even tortured, m mutilated. The, the Turks used to do that with, with other figures, but for some reason this was not the case. Uh, at that point, there was nothing else to do for Vlad II, by the way, to re-acknowledge um, the sultanial suzerainty uh, on Balakia, which also consisted in the, at least the promise, of a yearly tribute paid to the Ottomans in 1446 or 47. That's why it was an empire in the first place, taking away the resources from this other, um, from this uh, surrounding subjects. John Hunyadi, that at that point had finally become the r regent governor of Hungary, we're talking 1446, um, essentially invaded Wallachia at that point as, a, as an ally of, of uh, I mean, as he saw Wallachia as an ally of the Ottomans. We are in November 1447. And again, the Hungarians were using this frontier lens as a sort of uh, venting valve for uh, acquiring, say, new wealth and loot, etc., but also consolidating, in fact, the same, uh, the same position uh, in the south to keep the Ottomans as away as possible from, from Central Europe. That, of course, was the broader uh, strategic targets of the Turks in Central Europe. There is a Byzantine historian, politician, and scholar, Michael Crutobolus, who informs us that Vlad and Radu, at this point, escaped the Ottoman Empire, 
which likely means they were actually released because uh, the Wallachians now were backed by the Ottomans against the Hungarians, and so in order to reinforce this cooperation, um, this deal was brokered, right? Um, which had also costed uh, their father to pay homage to the same sultan, which was, of course, uh, quite of an humiliation and still a solemn oath. How desperate for the Wallachians this deal was is confirmed by the fact that, in spite of Ottoman support, both Vlad II and his eldest son Mirce were murdered by the Hungarians. Right? And uh, Hunyadi made Vladislav II, that was the son of Vlad uh, Dr- Dracul's cousin Dan II, um, uh, a voivode of the principality um, ruling this extraordinary five times per, because of all those sort of backs and forths of, again, we're not going to digress on him. But he, um, as the, the new ruler of Balakia, right, this guy was meant to be, again, the Hungarian uh, poem uh, in, uh, in the land because he was Balakian, but just Uh, At this point, uh, the Hungarians had gotten the upper hand, so they managed to to establish uh, this rule. However, this also meant for Vlad that, uh, of course, another line was was placed on what de facto would have been, uh, by inheritance right, his own throne uh, to the voivodeship, and he made his stand as a potential claimant to Wallachia, right? Vladislav II accompanied John Hunyadi uh, on a campaign against the Ottoman Empire in September 1448. Vlad, during the absence of Vladislav and, say, the, the Hungarian commitment further south, entered into Wallachia at the head of a Turkish force, right, that he had been provided, of course, uh, with by the Ottomans, in the early October of the same year. The price of which had been, however, the concession to the Ottomans of the strategic fortress of Giurgiu, uh in southern Romania, right, in, M- M- in the historical region of Montenegro that is located among the mud flats and marshes on the left bank of the Danube, just facing the Bulgarian city of Rus on the opposite bank. So you understand that this was an Ottoman, became an Ottoman foothold into Wallachia, right? Uh, the Turks seized the, the fortress and uh, on the Danube and strengthened it, reinforced it, um, and this was to create some problems. But at least Vlad managed to install himself as the ruler of, of Wallachia. This was quite of a, of a coup, telling the truth, um, which likely succeeded, however, because Hunyadi's army was defeated by the Ottomans uh, during that campaign that had brought, as we've seen, the same Vladislav uh, out of Wallachia at the Second Battle of Kosovo Polia. Right, uh, this was a big um, battle, right, in which the uh, essentially un- Hungarian-led Crusader army uh, in the Ottoman Empire fought for essentially a couple of days, um, and it was a significant um, defeat because it brought to the Ottoman uh, opening further to to Serbia that had already been defeated, uh, as you know, in the 14th century in the same place. And it's worth mentioning that um, in spite of the enormous losses that also the Ottomans suffered, um, there were, at least according to um, one source, um, 6,000 Wallachians killed in, in in the battle. Which would make you think that Vlad would maybe just come to rule on a relatively weakened country. Um, but it wasn't the case, because Vladislav II actually managed to extricate himself out of the 
say, the, the defeat politically and militarily, and was reinstated on on the throne. All right. Uh, this occurred essentially through a negotiation between the same Vlad and Munyadi's deputy, at least, that was uh, Nicholas Vizaknai, um, and that they had uh, urged uh, to come meet in, in Transylvania, but Vlad feared, as also his later life would prove, would vindicate him uh, about that this was a sort of uh, trap, right, that he would have passed from, from the Ottomans to the, to the Hungarians. So this allowed, practically, given still the, the Hungarian pressure from the north, Vladislav to return uh, to Wallachia, right, also with some Ottoman um, condiments, of course, or acceptation of this situation, because naturally, you know, um, the Battle of Kosovo had mostly affected um, the the Serbian despotate. Uh, Wallachia was another story, um, but we will see it on another occasion, the strategic situation. Um, there is a very interesting letter that Vlad sent to the councillors of Brasov in, in Transylvania um, before being forced to flee to the Ottoman Empire again. As a, at that point, as essentially a Wallachian pawn that the Ottomans could could install at some point in uh, in his uh, native land at some point, where in December uh, the seventh, fourteen forty eight. And Vlad wrote, we bring you the news that Nicholas Vizakna, so Uniades, a deputy as we've seen, writes to us and asks us to be so kind as to come to him until the regent of Hungary returns from the war. We are unable to do this because an emissary from Nicopolis came to us and said with great certainty that Basically, the the crusade forces had been defeated at Kosovo Polia, and if we come to Transylvania now, the Turks could come and kill both you and us, right? Because they would have thought at that point that Vlad was being co-opted by the uh, by the Hungarians, right? And he feared to be captured, by both so the safer. Um, option seemed to stick to the Ottoman side and the letter says therefore we ask you to have patience until we see uh, and he's talking really to, to Brashov because um, again his house had been ruling also across the Carpathians right he would say that, that his father had been ruling as we've seen between Balak and Transylvania uh, in this some sort of very decentralized uh, part of the Hungarian kingdom and if, if um, Hunyadi returns from the war Vlad writes we will meet him and we will make peace with him but if you will be our enemies now and if something happens you will have to answer for it before God right so these were allegedly loyal individuals uh, that uh, Vlad however did not trust um, in this uh, cataclysm that had occurred uh, in Serbia that was mixing all the cards again and not much to his favor. So while Vladislav remained in Wallachia, Vlad went to uh, over to the Ottomans. He stayed at Adrianople for a while. Um, shortly afterwards he went to Moldavia. He was led um, there this was the time of the rule of Prince Bogdan II, that was his father's brother-in-law, possibly even his, uh, I mean, Vlad's own maternal uncle. This was an interesting position for him to be because he was connected with the Ottomans, but also he could uh, parliament at the Moldavian court, given that Bogdan II had actually been uh, brought to power by the same Hunyadi, in 1449, uh, and the Turks could also 
be used a lot, a bit like a, as a connection in there. Um, Bogdan, just to tell how you know peaceful these realities were, was murdered by Peter the Third Aaron, right, the bastard son of Alexander Salbon that was uh, voivod uh, of Mo Moldavia back in multiple occasions. This is the, basically the entire story, like coming to power, being brought down, and this back and forth uh, forever going on. We are in autumn 1451, and at this point, Bogdan's son, Stephen III, that would become, in fact, the famous Stephen Seymar, Stephen the Great, as voivod of, of Moldavia, um, fled at that point to Transylvania, uh, together with Vlad, um, essentially to receive, to, to pass to, to the Hungarian side again, right? Um, and so escaping a bit the, the Ottoman influence and receiving assistance from Uniad. Wu, in the meanwhile, had, however, concluded a three year truce with the Turks, 1415. The only open way for Vlad at that point was the fact that Hunyadi had also acknowledged the Balakian boyar's right to elect the successor Vladislav if he had died um, as as voivod. So uh, the uh, the matter was obviously open, uh, thinking of the relatively short life that these rulers normally had. Uh, Vlad was also and evidently wanting to come back. Uh, he seems to have wanted to settle in Brasov, right? So um, this was the center which the Valachian exiles expelled by Vladislav uh, II had, uh, been, had gathered right uh, just across the Carpathians ready to come back in their noble possessions uh, confiscated just as Vlad. Um, however Uniadi that had stabilized the situation in Valachia temporarily had also forbidden the burghers of Brasov that as we've seen Vlad was in communication with to uh, give him shelter. This was issued in winter 1452 as a specific order because evidently Vlad had the the numbers right to qualify as a you know as the next voivode even with a coup and the support of this Valachian boyars in Transylvania. But there wasn't much at that point that he could do against Uniadi and the relatively pacified situation, so that he returned to Moldavia where uh, Alexandril, or Alexander II, um, had in the meanwhile dethroned Peter Aaron. Again, th these were all basically children of some other voivo that at some point had ruled like other three or four times, um, uh, uh, overthrown uh, eventually by somebody else. Um, so it, it's that frustratingly messed up for anyone to establish something firm. Uh, given this political thermometer. And we also do not know as a consequence much about Vlad's life in those years as well. We just know that before summer 1456 he, he went to Hungary uh, once again because on July the 3rd the burghers of Brasov had been informed by Hunyadi that the regent had tasked the same Vlad with the defense of the Transylvanian frontier, which naturally was also an opening to Vlad's Valachian comeback, right, with Hungarian blessing. Um, we do not know, in fact, how Vlad even came back to Valachia. Uh, we know that he invaded the land together with Hungarian forces provided to him um, sometime in the good season of 1456, right? Um, 
consider also the picture here Constantinople has fallen the Hungarians are freaking out they need some greater stability um, and it's possible that Vlad was sort of a better candidate than Vladislav regarding sort of um, double play with, with the Ottomans Vladislav died during the invasion, so here something changed politically, like Hunyadi didn't trust uh, Vladislav anymore, and Vlad um, installed himself as, in fact, Vlad III, Voivode of Wallachia, sending for us to document the fait accompli, a first letter to the burghers of Brasov on September the 10th, 1456, right, and he was saying something very eloquent, that is, he would protect them in case the Ottomans had invaded Transylvania, right, and Wallachia was in between, by the way, so this tells you also how sort of across the Carpathians um, the uh, Draculian uh, lordship really stretched, right. Vlad, however, also expected from the townsmen of Brasov their support if the Ottomans had, in fact, occupied Wallachia, right? So the, the situation is obvious. The Ottomans, if the Ottomans had conquered Wallachia, uh, the Transylvanians would have supported Vlad, but as long as Wallachia was in his command, they, the Transylvanians had to send troops to help the Wallachians. There is a um, note in this letter that says, When a man or prince is strong and powerful, he can make peace as he wants to. But when he is weak, a stronger one will come and do what he wants to him. Right. Um, so this was essentially an admonishment, showing essentially what the nature of power really was. And so it was practically uh, saying, Now I'm in charge, right, and uh, I'm... I'm in command, so let's make this thing work, otherwise we're all going to get weaker and somebody else will take our place anyway. Um, which, especially after the fall of Constantinople, was a very evident realization. There are multiple sources, including the Byzantine Greek historian from Athens, Laonikos Kalkondilas, uh, a chronicler, right, recording that uh, hundreds of thousands of people were allegedly, of course, executed by the order of Vlad at the beginning of his reign. Right? It's say one of the first, um, of course, uh, hyperbolic uh, hints of Vlad's personality and you know policy style. Uh, of course, there was much to settle in the same Valachia after all these coups. Many boyars, uh, the local nobility that had participated, for example, in the assassination of Vlad's father and elder brother, Mircea, um, and also just others that were suspected to be unloyal to him to have contact with, with the Ottomans or whichever other enemy of Wallachia, were killed um, in a way or another. Right, so you can imagine the, the very sort of feud-based, bloodthirsty uh, dimension in which was this was happening. Calcacondiles says that Vlad was very swift in carrying out this business and that he somehow gave a dramatic boost to Wallachia uh, in the process. Right, So he really acted as a strong man, providing all the loot that he had taken from his victims to his own clients, which is obviously what you want to do. So lots of heads, uh, you know, were severed and, uh, say, less of them were at the head of the same amount of property of land at least, because something they will have consumed. Um, and this is really interesting because um, not just shows, you know, what Vlad had evidently been wanted to do from the beginning, but also we get uh, an idea of who were those people that he rewarded. There was essentially a, a boy uh, vote council in which 
um, the two members uh, that uh, were evidently under Vlad, that is Vojtsov, Britsa and Jova, were able to maintain uh, positions for multiple years and that you know became some sort of iron arms that uh, would be necessary to cope with the new threats that were uh, appearing. So even though Hunyadi had uh, brought him to Wallachia, Vlad as a, a boy vote of his country kept pr- paying tribute to the Ottomans that routine, routinely threatened um, the the country otherwise. I mean, the Hungarians knew that there was nothing really that could be done in that regard. Um, Hunyadi died in 1456. Um, this year, as you know, is momentous because fundamentally all the great protagonists of the crusade could have pushed away the um, the Ottomans and even re- recaptured Constantinople. You were talking about uh, John of Capistrano, also of Pope Aeneas Silvius Piccolomini. Um, again, disappear at this point, and the Balkans are effectively left alone. There is an important watershed, right? Um, Ladislaus Hunyadi, uh, John's son, uh, succeeded him in, um, in Hungary as the captain general right, of the kingdom. And he essentially quarreled with Vlad, um, accusing him to have no intention to remain faithful to the kingdom of Hungary in a letter to the townsmen of Brasov. Right. In the same letter, Vladislaus ordered the townsmen to support Vladislaus the uh, the the second's brother that was Dan the third right uh, Dan the younger right so as a pretender of uh, to the throne of of Valachia against Vlad this is the constant back and forth Valachia was somehow very um, very loosely compact politically it was complicated to, to control to say at least by the same value votes um, across the land there were different sections that we've seen in the video about the foundations of of Valachia. so the the townsmen of Brasov that were the most influential uh, let's say uh, polity in uh, in Transylvania as far as the support against uh, say in this case against uh, Vlad w- were concerned. As there were other Transylvanian competitors, the townsmen of Sibiu, supporting their own pretender, a priest, right, of the Romanians, who apparently claimed to have uh, a boy vote uh, ancestry, as usual, this is the game, you know, I'm the, the son of the... It's not even irrealistic, to tell the truth, considering also the illegitimate sons, etc. For example, uh, this this latter guy supported by Sibio identified as the same Vlad's illegitimate brother, um, that is Vlad the Fort, Kilu Giru, if if I pronounce it correctly, that he is in fact the the monk, uh, and who took possession of um, Siliste, in fact a town in in the Sibiu county in, in Transylvania. Uh, that had um, historically been controlled by the uh, voivodes of Wallachia, but in Transylvania, as we've seen, as a possession that they had matured um, over time. This is this is fascinating, by the way, because we've seen it in the other video that gradually the Wallachians began to expand gradually into uh, from from the Carpathians in path, you know, in part those mountaineers that they really were, but also from the south. Of, that from properly the polity of Balakia, as this had been the case. Um, this was complicating um, the situation. Um, however, Ladislaus Uniadi was taken out by Ladislaus V, the posthumous, um, that was an Habsburg. Um, as you know, we talked about him in some videos about 
the, the rise uh, of this dynasty. We are in 1457. And Hunyadi's mother, Elizabeth uh, Shilagni, together with her brother Michael, started a rebellion against Ladislaus that had also some for, uh, was essentially a foreign base and again these various kings that arrived from the external and triggering the, the local nobiliar issues. So this was actually um, a stroke of fortune for Vlad because while Hungarian was engulfed in a civil war uh, Vlad could operate more freely. He for example assisted Stephen, the son of Bogdan II of Moldavia in his uh, rise to power uh, with a successful uh, successful coup that brought uh, in fact Stephen the Great in charge of, of, of Moldavia in 1457 Vlad also uh, invaded Transylvania and punished right, violently uh, Brasov and Sibiu by plundering the their surrounding villages um, this is actually acting on the uh, upon the, the warning that he had given to the to the Transylvanians uh, regarding their own fa- uh, fealty to him. Um, this is also part of the context from which the Black Legion about Vlad began, because the local Saxons um, that are really the the most uh, florid source of tales. Uh, uh, you know about uh, Vlad's uh, bloodthirst, right? Recount of the uh, deportations of men, women, and children from a Saxon village to Valachia by Vlad, who had them impaled, right? There are lots of anecdotes regarding Vlad's sort of uh, ferocious behavior that was somehow fair in its own terms, but also devoid of any scruple, right? The Transylvanian Saxons were, by the way, remaining loyal to the King of Hungary, right? Which essentially brought the position of the Shilages uh, to be strengthened by Vlad's attack. Vlad also sent uh, envoys to negotiate the peace between the uh, the Shilagi and the Saxons themselves um, so to try to pacify the area so that he could also profit further from it and according to the peace treaty the townsmen of Brasov agreed that they would have, have by the way to expel the pretended dam from their town which is of course um, obvious considering that now Vlad had brought them to their knees um, and uh, the voivode promised in fact that the merchants of Sibiu could now freely buy and sell goods in Valachia um, for the same treatment that of course the Valachian merchants were to receive in Transylvania. Here we have also the, the stories of the Saxon merchant that goes to Vlad to complain the fact that somebody has stolen um, a chariot full of oranges and Vlad basically managed to to find the the thief uh, who he had uh, taken out um, and he brought back all the oranges except one to the merchant who was greedy however and so um, and and complained about the fact there was one orange left and Vlad basically telling if you don't get out of the way I will have you killed uh, and so this is kind of the the character who was was described. Um, Vlad uh, strengthened ties with Michael Shilagi, who he defined uh, his lord and elder brother in 1457. So to essentially uh, undermine Hungarian unity, um, at least in that context of civil war, to his own, of course, uh, favor, given that this was making Transylvania more politically distant in general from what the Hungarian crown could do, right? Except Ladislaus Uniadis' younger brother, the famous uh, Matthias Corbinus, 
about Wilma made a video especially regarding his black army and we will have to come back on that naturally and frequently. There is all a medieval Hungarian history uh, playlist right, if, you, if you are interested in it which contains also Transylvanian history because that was technically part of the Renum. Um, was elected as uh, king of Hungary. We've seen exactly that passage uh, at the beginning of 1458. Matthias ordered the burghers of Sibiu to maintain the peace with Vlad, right? Because the, he wasn't searching for trouble either. Uh, in the very delicate situation that he was in, as basically any king of Hungary at that point, um, at that point, Vlad styled himself as lord and ruler over all of Wallachia and the duchies of Amlash and Fagarash in 1459, showing that he had basically occupied those um, Transylvanian thieves of the rulers of Wallachia and thus affirmed its own control. And this is a very strategic area, by the way, because he controlled, of course, the southern Carpathians and that as far as also the uh, the traditional boats of the Unionis, for example, and the uh, also the, the possible routes of um, invasion from north and south, right across the area, like he, you know, he would particularly benefit from. Um, Michael Shilaji allowed, by the way, the um, boyar Michael, that was one of the former, say, one of. The, the officials of Vladislav II back in the day, so an enemy of Vlad, and other Wallachian noblemen to settle in Transylvania. So seemingly Vlad's uh, say appreciation was a bit too uh, too hasty. We are in 1458. Um, Vlad reacted by having Michael murdered, which seems also pretty coherent overall. You understand what, what the logic here. It was remaining fair, uh, yet stern at the same time. Um, and in the same 1458, Vlad asked, again, the townsmen of Brashov to send uh, some help and craftsmen to the same Wallachia. That was definitely a less developed uh, region than, um, than uh, at least the the Burzenland, the, the, the Saxon, the Saxon cities, um, were really quite different areas historically, um, and the obvious purpose was being sort of to boost Wallachian uh, economy. And this is fascinating because it's as if Vlad was counting on his um, capacity to even resist invasions in this historical moment, even after the Ottomans were rapidly expanding in the region. Um, how, and this is likely also why the relation between him and the Saxons uh, deteriorated. Because naturally, he first of all didn't have the, like the full control on these communities. He could just basically uh, transcend them. However, it is true that the Saxons were themselves interested in Wallachian resources, and they would occasionally enter uh, the land for their. Uh, say, exchanges. Vlad exploited this by essentially blocking the Carpathian passes, uh, so preventing the Saxons from entering Wallachia from the north, except in some specific centers run by uh, specific Wallachian merchants, right? Uh, essentially, there were some border fairs that he established uh, himself, which the, the, Val uh, the, the Transylvanians could not move further south, and so obliging them with force to just, if they wanted to trade in Wallachia, to do so just uh, with those guys that he had uh, chosen, right? So this tells you um, this is these are just anecdotes, by the way. There is some historiographical debate on whether this was an, an actual thing. We do not have much documentation, as you can expect. This would be in conflict, by the way, with what Vlad himself said in 1476, uh, magnifying the free trade uh, he would have allegedly promoted during his reign. So, unfortunately, I think these things cannot quite be... Um, 
unveiled uh, satisfactorily. In any case, the Saxons uh, confiscated at some point the steel that a Valachian merchant had bought in Brasov, right? They wouldn't repay him. Um, this brought Vlad to literally kidnap and torture some German merchants. Uh, we know that from a letter that he sent to uh, Basar Ablayot, it was essentially the, the, uh, another uh, Valachian nobleman and the son of Dan II. Um, Basara had settled at this point in Sigishoara and was um, claiming uh, the, the voivodeship of Valachia himself, so they were not really in good relations, but this detail emerges, and exactly because of that, because he was essentially from the other side, and uh, likely, you know, that he was interfering with this Transylvanian uh, crimes. Uh, Matthias Corvinus, at this point, was still supporting Dan III, who had, by this point, established himself again in Brasov against Vlad, right? So at this point, uh, the voivode of, of Valachia was uh, increasingly isolated, um, then complained that some German merchants and their children had been impaled or burnt alive in Vlad's um, territory, which... Again, it's something we shouldn't so be we shouldn't be so surprised that that these are the, the voices of cruelty that, however, his political opponents were writing. So the the, the likelihood is that, uh, in spite of the the bloodshed that Vlad carried out eagerly at some point, it's, he wasn't really or necessarily bloodier than other, say, rulers of the time. It, it surely appears like a possibility, because he was quite iron-fisted, to say the least. But you may never know exactly what was going on, given the level of documentation that that we have. Basarab um, uh, complains that 300 boys from Bashov and Tsara Barse had been impaled, some other been burned, uh, etc. So, this could be also a political machination of some sort to smear the, the political opponent. In any case, Dan w- essentially broke into Wallachia. Bad move, because he was defeated there by Vlad, who had him executed in 1460. Um, politically, what Vlad does makes a lot of sense. right? Surely there were these issues with the Transylvanian merchants, um, and uh, these just enemy proxies, right, uh, next to just across the Carpathians weren't the ideal. So these provocations, these challenges were met with adequate response, we can notice. After this victory, Vlad, by the way, invaded again the south of Transylvania and destroyed yet again the suburbs of Brasov ordering the impalement of all men and women captured on the occasion. Vlad also demanded during the following negotiations that all the Balakian refugees, so political enemies, um, exiles uh, from Brasov uh, to be expelled uh, or punished for their crimes. So that by Summer 1460, these actions had brought to some sort of pacification. Um, Vlad addressed again the townsmen of Brasov as his brothers and friends. This is a formal say, euphemism for diplomatic uh, purpose. Vlad invaded uh, at that point again the region around Amlash and Fagarash in the following months to support those individuals that had supported Dan III. Um, So again, a very effective deterrence and repression. The famous um, Serbian soldier and author uh, Konstantin Mihailovic, 
who also served, by the way, as a Janissary in the Ottoman army, and that, as we've seen in the videos about Ottoman warfare, is one of the most prominent sources on Ottoman customs, next to essentially the, on the only insider, aside from some Byzantine chronicler plus, but, you know, after the, uh, the Western, mostly Italian, authors, um, records that Vlad refused to pay homage at some point, we do not know exactly which year, but around these ones, to the Sultan, which already shows you which um, contempt he held uh, the Turks um, on the other side as well. There is a Renaissance historian, Deliangiolelli, that writes that uh, Vlad had um, not paid at some point the tribute to the Ottomans for three years, confirming essentially what Mihailovic was, was talking about. If we look at the chronology, this would set the possible date of, say, stop of the tribute around 1459. It's also worth mentioning that the aforementioned sources are writing decades after this. Uh, the aforementioned Tursun Beg stated that Vlad had uh, essentially uh, turned against the Ottoman Sultan only when the latter was uh, involved in his expedition against Trebizond that, as you know, was essentially one of the last uh, Byzantine uh, out the, the last major Byzantine outpost, right of the Ramp states um, after 1453 and 1461, right? Um, so this would be a good chance because, you know, Trebizond is far east uh, and um, Vlad could act against the Turks uh, from the far west, right? Um, the same source, by the way, states that the voivode of Wallachia uh, began to negotiate um, a sort of anti-Turkish deal with Matthias Corvinus. The Ottoman spies had immediately learned of this because they were pretty much uh, everywhere. Um, so that Mehmet II, at this point feeling uh, outraged, sent the uh, Gr uh, Greek ambassador Thomas Katobolinos, um, also known in Turk as uh, Yunus Bey, right, to Wallachia. And this was an injunction to Vlad, uh, who was ordered to present himself in Constantinople, right? Um, the, uh, the, the Greek envoy also sent secret instructions to Amza, Bey of Nicopolis, to capture Vlad as soon as he would have crossed the Danube to go to Constantinople. Except the Voivode found out of all this uh, plot and he managed to capture both Amza and Catabolinus that, as you understand, um, wouldn't leave particularly longer after that. Um, after the execution of these officials, by the way, Vlad um, passed uh, on to action. He recaptured the aforementioned fortress of Giorgio, remember the one that he had basically uh, sold to the Ottomans, to enter in Wallachia. He showed up in front of the fortress. These Wallachians were camouflaged as Turks, and say, we will talk about this more in depth, but don't think that say, in terms of arm and armor there wasn't much uh, difference uh, in the first place, and of course there were tricks to pass for one another. Apparently Vlad was pretty much into this, because remember, he had been in Turkey himself, um, and in a perfect Turkish, in fact, he um, asked the commander of the Ottoman fortress to open the gates, which allowed actually his own Wallachian soldiers to break into and storm in it. Um, this uh, ruse, he managed to recapture George. At this point, so having essentially recovered the 
this important fortress on the on the left bank of the Danube, he crossed the river into what was the Ottoman Empire, devastating the villages, in fact, along the Danube, so to create, as it had historically been done on this frontier, this sort of layer, right, this sort of um, frontier, the populated area, to push, in fact, the, the, the border further south, also in terms of local Ottoman capacity of reorganization and so on, right. Vlad wrote, um, and it's interesting, right, how he managed different um, different languages, how he wrote himself, he was a relatively civilized individual for, for the times and places. In 1462, uh, of this uh, exploit, the same Matthias Corbinus that, as we've seen, was essentially blessing him for that, he stated... Uh, Vlad himself, that more than 23,884 Turks and Bulgarians had been slaughtered during the campaign. So these were Ottomans and I Islamic uh, uh, Bulgarians, right, converts uh, to the to the new faith. Um, and this shows you again, you know, the, the capacity of killing. We we can wonder how he could count to the <laughs> to the unit like uh, th this number but the fact that the figures are in tens of thousands and the fact that he launched this pretty vast raid along the Danube is, is quite significant right he had put these people to death and displaced uh, evidently much more um, this was also surely a, a propagandistic mean to seek further military support from Matthias Corbinus um, Vlad essentially described himself in these letters as a faithful vassal that was fighting for the honor of the king and holy crown of Hungary, right, and also for the preservation, as he said, literally, of Christianity and the strengthening of the Catholic faith, which was an explicit reference to the crusading um, language that, of course, had seen the Hunyadis just signing, say, leading the, the, the Christian effort together with the Pope against the Ottomans up to recent years. Because, think about that, right? Until uh, John Hunyadi had been around, and of course the Crusade had been gaining steam until 56, um, the Wallachians were, yes, no, say not particularly happy of seeing Hungarian presence revived, but now, say, the, the major threat came from the Ottomans, um, and they're didn't, I made multiple videos on, on this uh, situation after Constantinople 1453. There didn't seem to be any particular interest or force or enthusiasm in the West for, for another crusade that in fact wouldn't happen. Um, so um, the um, there were other problems, by the way. For example, the Wallachians were now at odds with the Moldavians. At least the Genoese governor of Kaffa in Crimea that was very interested in, in Balkan affairs against the Ottomans that were essentially threatening to, to wipe out these Italian colonies from the air, as it would happen later on with uh, overwhelming um, military power from land and sea, um, uh, noticed. Um, this, this aspect is fascinating. I made multiple videos about the situation between the Italians, the Tartars, and the Ottomans in the Black Sea, um, and we will. There, there is a video that uh, we we saw this well enough in the video about medieval Moldavia, but there is also one about slightly earlier times, the so-called Judgment Day, right, of Constantinople that addresses this. Um, the, the Italians, by the way, were supporters, and especially the Genoese, because they did so from the Black Sea, were supporting Moldavia and, and Wallachia against the Ottomans, right? So they, they had a lot of informants, and they cared very much about uh, the situation, even more than the Venetians, as far as these two powers were concerned. But as we will see, those would came into play as well. Um, according to Calcondylus, um, Mehmet II felt so um, insulted by by Vlad's attack in in uh, into into Trace that 
he collected an enormous army, second in size only to the one that had taken Constantinople in 1453, so a massive one. The Byzantine author says 150,000 men strong. Naturally, this is ridiculous, to say the least. Also because while it is possible that this army could have been designed to occupy Wallachia, Mehmed had granted this land to Vlad's brother Radu, right, in case the, the invasion had succeeded. So, um, as it would be a, a bit Ottoman policy as far as this northern possession, it wouldn't quite be um, necessarily a, a direct occupation of the land. It was some other ways, say, in terms of cost-benefit ratio, to, to bring them down. In any case, this invasion was serious enough um, as the Ottomans attacked uh, Braila in Montania, essentially the Balakian port on the Danube, um, in May of 1462. The Ottoman army also crossed the Danube under the command of the same Mehmet II, so of course the expedition was serious enough. Um, he passed the river at Nicopolis, the same of 1396 Crusade, we are in June, right? And Vlad at this point was outnumbered as the Ottomans had really mobilized greater forces than his, and he opted as a consequence in that condition of strategic inferiority for a scorched earth policy, retreating to Sirgovista, that is um, essentially in the 80 kilometers northwest of Bucharest on the right bank of the Yalomitsa River. Um, during the night of June 1670, Vlad, who had decided to pass to counterattack by taking the enemy by surprise, broke uh, successfully, by the way, into the Ottoman camp in an attempt to capture or kill the Sultan. This was a, a major feat of bravery and capacity. It tells you really what these um, black uh, warriors really were, were about, right? In 15th century warfare, and in the, we will talk again about the, the types of arms and armor used at this point, but um, it's the, like, how bold can you be? Um, and the interesting thing is that uh, Mehmet was almost killed um, in the um, uh, in, in the enterprise right uh, the purpose was to even kidnap him if it had been possible so with this right night incursion but it is an exceptional commando capacity basically um, and that feat alone uh, had it been successful could have simply uh, destroyed the Ottoman army entirely, because uh, at the death or capture of the Sultan, everything would have been so clamorous, right? Um, unfortunately, however, the Wallachians missed um, this. Um, they failed to achieve this objective, um, and they attacked uh, instead the tents of the viziers, Mahmud Pasha Angelovich, uh, and Isaac. Vlad and his retainers uh, that were being surrounded by the Ottoman uh, forces that at dawn now were trying to 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 regroup the rally to to react and, and would have overwhelmed the intruders just by numbers pulled out uh, safely with, with their lives. However, Mehmet entered Turgoviste uh, at the end of the same June, um, this town had basically been abandoned by the uh, by the residents in the expectation, of course, of of the invasion. However, right, and this is what the uh, blacks left uh, for the Ottomans to see uh, in full display was a literal forest of the impaled, thousands of carcasses of executed people essentially 
impaled through stakes, right? At least this is what uh, Calco Nilas says, and this was uh, we can we can read this but the passage from the histories. The Sultan's army entered into the area of the impalements, which was 17 states long. Right, it was just like the entire, you know, an entire trade of the road, right? And seven states wide. It was a literal uh, forest. There were large stakes there on which, as it was said, about 20,000 men, women and children had been spitted. Quite a sight for the Turks and the Sultan himself. The Sultan was seized with amazement and said that it was not possible to deprive of his country a man who had done such great deeds, who had such a diabolical understanding of how to govern his realm and its people. Right, it sounds like Marlon Brando in Apocalypse Now, right, in the, in the, in the last, in the monologue. And, and he said that a man who had done such things was worth much. So the Ottomans, from the top of their habitual atrocities, um, were actually admiring Vlad for the same. The rest of the Turks were dumbfounded when they saw the multitude of men on the stakes. There were infants too affixed to their mothers on the stakes, and birds had made their nests in their entrails. Right. These are scenes that would actually replicate themselves throughout all the Ottoman uh, Christian wars, right, in the later centuries, but this is just also what the 15th century Valakins were made. Naturally, Calcondylas is, say, telling stories in a bit of an embellished mode for uh, the sake of, of literature, but, right, uh, these things uh, did happen. Um, Tursun Bag tells, by the way, that the Turks uh, had been suffering during the campaign. Uh, of thirds, especially because of the summer heat, um, and uh, the Ottomans thus decided essentially to retreat from Balakir because they had a big army, right, and marching towards Braila, as we've seen in, in Montania. At this point, Stephen the Third of Moldavia had uh, gone up to Kilia in today's Ukraine to strip the Ottomans of the local fortress that had this was essentially the, the most, one of the most important fortresses in in the Black Sea especially as far as the Moldavian uh, uh, strategy was was considered um, and uh, for, for the traffics um, was particularly relevant it's just like a major asset for the, for the Principality of Moldavia to seize alone um, Hungarian tr troops had been uh, replacing the Turkish one as a consequence, because these were, again, the, the Moldavians and the Valakians were acting on behalf of, of Hungary as well, that had provided support, so much so that Vlad himself also departed from Kilia, leaving behind uh, a contingent, so as to say, 6,000 strong, um, to essentially hinder the march of the Ottoman army, right? However, the Turks at this point managed to defeat the Valachians because they were just stronger. Um, yet this was a war of attrition, as you understand, to, to some extent. Um, and Stephen of Moldavia was even uh, wounded during the siege of Kilia and uh, returned, in fact, home before even Vlad came to the fortress. So uh, very heavy efforts from these black um, principalities to just inflict as much damage as possible to the Ottomans in spite of their relatively limited resources and uh, as we've seen with incredible feats of bravery. Um, the Turks left uh, with their main army at least Valachia. Some mm, smaller outposts of course were still manned. Vlad's brother Radu and his Turkish troops down, as we've seen, Radu had been essentially uh, won over by the, the Ottomans, right? That had, just like with Vlad and Vladislav uh, before, 
sort of promised him that voivod ship um, and he had remained uh, behind in the Barragan plain it is essentially part it's part of the steps right in southeast Romania towards say is the um, in the eastern part of the Valachian plain the easternmost part of Valachia that develops longitudinally so just west of the Bruja so between with the Bruja between the Black Sea and and this plain right Radu sent at that point some envoys to the same Vlad admonishing him that from there the Turks could still easily invade because basically they could uh, control again the uh, say the, this both maritime and continental routes of invasion All right um, Vlad had de facto defeated Radu in this contest for power um, and also the, the Turks uh, in general in two battles right uh, that followed um, yet right uh, the sense that his position was you know beginning to be difficult because of course the war had been costly for the Valachians as well is that many of the latter begin to desert to his brother as well for this reason Vlad um, uh, realized that he, he was in grave peril and he crossed the Carpathians intention to reach Matthias Corvinus uh, that could replenish him with troops um, help him uh, say re uh, reestablish his voivodeship um, however Albert of Eastern Mezzo that was the deputy of the Count of the Shekelis, a people of alleged Hunnic descent that dwelt in, in fact, the very south of Transylvania that had historically been settled there by uh, the Hungarians, uh, were at least, you know, the, with the task of protecting the, in fact, the frontier against, uh, as they would at this point also against the Ottomans, had recommended themselves um, in the same year uh, the Saxons recognize Radu as opposed to Vlad as ruler of Transylvania. So this was essentially transforming to a coup, right? Radu um, essentially began to bribe the townsmen of Brasov with the promise of confirming their commercial privilege, which is to compensate uh, them, their, their losses suffered also by by Vlad, right? Uh, with fifteen thousand ducats, right? So this was quite appealing, and gradually Vlad's power began to melt away. Matthias Corvinus was aware that this was a, a dangerous situation for the balance of the region, so he went to Transylvania uh, in the autumn of fourteen sixty two. Um, where he met with Vlad and the two uh, negotiated for weeks, right? Uh, seeing how difficult it was even for Matthias to support Vlad, that initially again had been his own man, right? So it, it's as if the outcome of the Ottoman um, war, right, of the retaliation against the same order that Matthias had essentially established with the Moldavians and the Valachians in the attack on the Turks had sort of backfire to some extent. Um, at this point, in fact, Matthias did not want to continue the war against the Turks, and Vlad had somehow, as we've seen, spent himself um, personally, politically, um, as a wall, right, for that cause, so it was difficult now to come back to Malachi and simply, you know, make things work like before, with all this opposition mounting, by the way. Um, so, Matthias decided finally to arrest Vlad, who was captured near Rutsar in, in Valachia, albeit um, in the northern eastern part of the of the Argesh, right? So it's it's very it's in the Carpathians, right? So it's in the far north uh, um, at the border with Transylvania. Um, the man who carried out the capture was John Giscrow Brandis. Uh, there was a Czech mercenary uh, adventurer 
uh, that uh, you know now we don't have time to just digress on Matthias Corvinus involvement in in Bohemia but I made a video just about that right as far as the Black Army was concerned why he fought there where he almost risked to be captured by the way um, in any case um, the situation was awkward internationally for the simple reason that Pope Pius II and the Venetians uh, who had sent actually a substantial amount of money to finance uh, the war against the Turks wanted to know why Vlad, that was again the, the guy on, on the forefront, had been arrested. So again also this background is pretty complicated, I can't quite digress just on it. But to make the long story short, um, the Hungarians fabricated um, some letters that would have allegedly been written by Vlad um, uh, showing that he would have in this sense uh, been plotting uh, together with the Turks uh, actually against um, the money that had arrived from Italy um, and um, the recipients of these letters that would have been intercepted etc uh, would have been sent to the same Mehmet II, Mahmud Pasha and also Stephen of Moldavia so to uh, extend say the, the evidence of the proof etc and this was, sto this was the official position that Matthias um, used at this point but modern historiography basically tells us that it was all a fraud that Vlad of course had never thought to you know to, to, to make agreements with the Turks especially in that uh, situation um, and the same uh, Italian humanist and poet serving as a court historian in Hungary under King Matthias Corvinus, we're talking about Antonio Bonfini, explicitly said that even as a, essentially an official historian of the Hungarian crown that um, there was never like uh, an explanation for what had happened to the voivode of Balakia, right? Um, so uh, the the, uh, the there was here surely some broader conspiracy against Vlad, right? Likely the Saxons of Brasov had participated in this for this, uh, uh, etc. Uh, in any case, this was enough for Matthias to imprison Vlad in Alba Julia, according to Calco Condylas. Eventually Vlad was brought to Visegrad, right, in, in the north of Budapest, right, so on, on the right bank of the Danube, in the Danube band far, pretty far away from his homeland, where he would remain for 14 years, right. Um, this is uh, a major watershed naturally in the life of Vlad that in fact is not documented between this 1462 and 1475. In the summer of which Stephen III of Moldavia sent some uh, ambassadors to Matthias Corvinus asking him to send Vlad to Balakia against the um, contemporary ruler that was the aforementioned Basara Blayota for the simple reason that this guy had basically fallen into Ottoman submission and he was no good for the task, right? You can imagine how Vlad would have felt, right? Such a vengeful, uh, bloody and, you know, uh, authoritarian individual that had managed to become voivode of Wallachia after years of, uh, you know, threats, uh, plots, violence, etc., that now had spent out of 14 years, right, brewing his uh, resentment uh, and bloodthirst, right? So Stephen, by the way, in this, um, uh, it's interesting because Stephen and, and Matthias had quite some political and military issues going on. Um, but they they also were 
pretty long lasting rulers for the times and places um, and he was essentially convinced um, also knowing Vlad you know that uh, Valakia would have been secure um, under such uh, a true enemy of the Turks like Vlad was right there, there is this interesting um, legacy that you know Stefan Se um, Stefan Seymar um, is in fact the, the the white knight of of uh, the situation right uh, for Rom in Romanian history whereas Vlad is the is the black one right the, the Apollonian and the Dionysian um, th these are the bit the legions that were sown on them but y y of course there was some truth uh, to it in fact, Stephen added this sort of Sibylline uh, phrase in the letter, that is to say that he wanted Vlad at the head of, of Valachia because, quote, the Valachians were like the Turks to his Moldavian insight, meaning that essentially they were as ferocious as the Turks and that a true leader of theirs could, you know, really be quite a, a thorn in the side to the Sultan. Um, there were lots of things going on there are lots of stories, legions and anecdotes also regarding the religious issues revolving around Vlad's um, liberation that entailed uh, his possible uh, conversion to Catholicism given that Hungary of course was a Catholic country whereas the Valachians were fundamentally orthodox um, the Slavic folklore tells us about this that's not so important now uh, that was all an issue as we've seen with the crusaders with the you know with the pope with the idea of crusade with this internationally concerted effort to keep the Ottomans under under check fundamentally we have the last period of Vlad's life that is tragic of course and ending in death um, Matthias was convinced by Stephen the Great um, in recognizing Vlad as the lawful prince of Valachia that he also technically was if you look at the dynastic history at least in, in the previous generations um, the problem though is that um, Vlad was not provided again by the Hungarians with military assistance to regain Valachia right? in other words they sort of let him go um, so much so that Vlad settled in a house in Pest after this 14 years of prison. You can imagine even just from a physical point of view or mentally what, you know, how much had changed, really. He was not a kid anymore, evidently. Um, and there was a group of soldiers that broke out into his own abode while pursuing a thief who had tried to hide in this mansion and Vlad um, essentially killed the guards because they had not asked his permission before entering his home. This is at least uh, a Slavic story about his life and there is a bit of that sort of uh, you know dark aura um, around him uh, and his bloody tendencies but who knows, right? It would have been interesting to be there when these things happen, if they did. Um, so Vlad moved to Transylvania as the gate to Wallachia in uh, 1475. He wanted to settle in Sibiu, and he sent some of his men to arrange uh, an abode there. Um, Mehmed II, who was also still alive, acknowledged uh, Bazar Blayota no, uh, as lawful ruler of Wallachia wanting to reinforce a sultanial poem um, he was evidently worried of Vlad's presence because he had not forgotten what you know had happened uh, that night in, in the camp uh, many years before still because you do not want to know that literally Vlad Sepesh is out there in the night hunting for you right having the guts to come literally to where you have your greatest force concentrated and making that mess in order to find you um, 
it, it was as we've seen Sibiu was not really a friendly place to Vlad historically so Corvinus was probably moved um, by the misery of, of the former Voivode so that he paid uh, the the local townsmen with 200 golden florins from the very royal revenues for Vlad to stay there right however Vlad left um, at that point for Buddha in a, in a short while again I don't know when that happened honestly I think there may have been this local problems like they didn't want him there now that he was uniquely not so connected uh, too much at least Cor Matthias Corbinus has not done too much in that regard um, so Vlad bought a house in Patch this is known as Dracula Hatza, so Dracula's house today, right in, in the place. At the beginning of 1476, the voivode of Transylvania, John Pongraj of Dengelag, by the way, yes, there was, uh, as we've seen in the previous video about the old Transylvanian voivode, um, as well, that was somehow more framed with, under the, you know, the Hungarian royal. Uh, authority than the Balakian one or the Moldavian one was but technically they were, they were similar um, urged the population of Brasov to send to Vlad all uh, those of his supporters who had settled in, in Brasov because um, in other words the Matthias Corbinus and Basara Blayota had found an agreement um, and this was not good news for Vlad at least and his supporters that in part had remained people that had fought and bled with him back in the day and that had suffered a blow once he was arrested so this created problems because um, the same Transylvanian Saxons were not at that it's not that they liked Vlad more than much as we've seen it but they didn't like any Valachian Voivo so that Basara was always a problem there and they thought like if we support Vlad he may uh, you know uh, he may be weak and we can't have it easier uh, for our trade etc this is the reason why the Germans sheltered um, in 1476 different opponents of Basara including Vlad. The um, Corvinus dispatched at this point Vlad and the uh, Serbian nobleman Vuk Grurevic Brankovic, right, the titular despot of Serbia, by the way, from 1471 until his death in 1485, but this had been taken over by the Ottomans, but he was recognized by Matthias. Corbinus as despot and ruled most of present-day Voivodina under the Hungarians, so he was just next door to his uh, lost despotate uh, to fight against the Ottomans in Bosnia. So Matthias sort of gave Vlad this chance to reintegrate himself, you know, also in a military role, um, and this campaign. Mm, began uh, uh, Vuk and Vlad captured Srebrenica a uh, small mountain town but um, a strategically significant one uh, together with other fortresses uh, at the beginning of the same year um, this Bosnian campaign was used by Vlad to release his um, resentment right his terror tactics against the Ottomans right in fact he resumed to mass impale captured Ottoman troops and massacring Islamic civilians as well in the conquered settlements this is particularly important you know that Bosnia would become historical also the base for the Ottoman raids uh, pretty far and wide against Christian land so th this context predates the atrocities that were exchanged reciprocally 
um, from, for centuries to come. Um, Vlad troops distinguished themselves in the destruction of the same Srebrenica, Kulsat, and Zvornik, um, the latter in, um, on the left of the Drina River. So these operations uh, showed definitely what kind of, you know, breed um, Vlad really was. Um, and this seemed frightening because the voices of what had happened in Bosnia, uh, the new thousands of uh, Ottomans uh, slaughtered and impaled, um, reached Mehmet II, and as we've seen, probably had some sort of psychological issues with this as well. Um, in the moment in which, by the way, he was invading Moldavia, this occurred slightly later, uh, at, at least, you know, the, the Bosnian campaign is like in winter 1476, um, this Ottoman invasion of Moldavia is in summer 1476, and uh, Stephen III was, by the way, defeated at the Battle of Valea Alba, uh, that uh, really had important consequences that the Ottomans suffered heavy losses uh, as well but it was yet another blow to the Christian front um, the Hungarian commander um, Stephen Bathory and Vlad Tsepes entered Moldavia uh, to the aid of, of Stephen and managed to leave the siege of the fortress at um, Tirgu Neamt by the end of the campaign, so uh, managing to shift, let's say, but the outcome of this, uh, of the same. Uh, there were uh, different figures participating uh, in the in the Moldavian campaign, by the way, the aforementioned Vuk um, Grugrevich, also noble of the house of Yaksic, that was yet another prominent noble uh, house of Serbia, Jakob Unrest, um, and uh, this is just to say how much this Balkan and Central and part Eastern European peoples had uh, in common, let's say, against this struggle. And it is somehow sad because these countries were essentially to decline historically uh, in these ambitions of, um, of power. I mean, the, the Ottoman invasion of the Balkans had de facto deprived the Serbians of their own national. Uh, accomplishment historically you can argue that of course the Balkan crisis is not yet solved um, as we hear sometimes from the news even though fortunately m a great part of it has been settled um, so there are definitely many uh, reflections one could make about this sort of broader participation um, this activity, this propositivity and, um, and force was appreciated by Matthias Corvinus who at that point ordered the Transylvanian Saxons to prepare the logistics and the supplies for Bathory's invasion of Balakia that started uh, in, in September of the same year after those uh, operations um, Stephen of Moldavia, in spite of what he had suffered during the invasion, would participate because they understood essentially now they were they were to take out um, those who had supported the Ottomans in Wallachia, right? And uh, it was important to do this in the wake of forces that had managed to stand uh, the ground against the the Ottomans. Um, Vlad stayed in Brasov, right, and confirmed at this point the trade rights of the local townsmen so he began to act again as a sort of an authoritative figure in this context um, Bathory's forces were successful in capturing Tirgoviste in November 
uh, and uh, Stephen the Great uh, and Vlad at this point had a ceremony in which they confirmed their own alliance and friendship is also sort of moving after all what had happened um, and they occupied jointly Bucharest forcing the Ottoman uh, pawn Bazarab Layotha in fact to escape uh, among the Turks uh, in the same month Vlad let the townsmen of Brasov uh, learn of their of his victory uh, and they asked uh, he asked them to come to Balakia to celebrate his crowning which was uh, done in the same uh, carried out in the same November of course the country needed supplies uh, support etc so this was all a mean to to show that it was feasible after all to push the Ottomans away still this late uh, in time through such joint effort you know that Hungary was in a bit of trouble throughout all this time but uh, I also made a video about the uh, late medieval Hungarian army organization we'll, we'll talk more about Hungarian military history during this time because it's really fascinating you have all these other peoples by the way participating uh, some of which were distrusted the Serbians for example at, at this point had largely uh, given way to the Ottomans so aside from certain families as we've seen there was a general sense that they were unreliable but it was a very complicated scenario right in which Hungary was giving way to the oligarchs and there were adventurers like people Spano from Italy, for example, like carving himself a, just a, you know, uh, a mini uh, state within the same Hungary, right? Just th this kind of things that, uh, say, Matthias Corbinus sort of kept under check, but that after him were basically making the situation collapse uh, to the Ottoman favor, by the way, which is even more tragic. Um... Bazarab Layotha, by the way, returned to Valachia at some point with uh, Turkish forces. And this is the moment in which uh, Blood uh, was killed, fighting against them. Uh, this happened literally just afterward in maybe the, the end of 14, the same 1476 or the beginning of 1477. Because it's how fluid the situation was after all. Um, in fact, we have a letter dated January the 10th, 1477, in which Stephen the Great uh, acknowledged that Vlad's Moldavian regiment had also been massacred in that fight. Right. Um, we do not have incredibly reliable sources about the event. Um, we, however, have an idea of uh, an engagement with few thousands of men from side, um, and Vlad was significantly outnumbered, perhaps even a half of the enemy forces that he met at Snakov, uh, north of Bucharest, uh, in, in Montania, um, and nobody really knows how. Vlad died, right? The, the idea is that he died in combat. There are other legions actually about him. Yeah, the, mm, so the, there is something that adds to the mystery of how he passed, right? And so also for the later legions to to malign, to, to malign I'll say, about his um, his possible uh, devilish uh, connection. Um, Jakob Unrest, uh, that as we've seen had actually participated to some of these uh, operations, he was uh, an Austrian chronicler, right? Stated that um, the Ottomans managed to kill Vlad in his camp through uh, this guy's agent, while the Russian statesman, philosopher, and poet Fyodor Kuritsin, who, um, by the way, was with uh, Vlad's family after his passing, so presumably hearing reliable 
info about um, his death tells that the Voivode was killed by the same Valachians during uh, a battle, right? Because he uh, was habitually uh, dressing up like a Turk, right? Uh, in disguise, right? And uh, as we've seen, this had been part of his customs, and God knows what happened in these battles. Because 15th century warfare is quite fascinating. We made lots of videos about that, but we forget to stress how, especially in these areas, like, uh, but not only like this, how what what a battlefield could be, right? Uh, ambushes, small units here and there, not necessarily the big pitch battle. And we think, I mean, normally that would be the case, but guerrilla, as we've seen it. it Commando operations, incursions, uh, night fights. Um, these are contexts in which you could imagine the same blood to have been um, involved, um, in spite of age. Uh, but you know, these people were really tough um, in uh, it, to be exchanged, to be killed accidentally. Um, and historiography agrees even about this possibility. Uh, the Milanese ambassador to Buddha, Leonardo Botta, says that Vlad's corpse was taken by the Turks and uh, cut in two pieces. Right, so there was definitely an engagement of some sort in which his uh, body was taken and, um, uh, you know, in in insulted by by the Turks. Uh, Bonfini. As we've seen, the the uh, official say historian of, of the Hungarian court tells us that Vlad's severed head was sent to the Sultan Mehmed II, that had evidently been eager for for a long time to see that, and placed, by the way, on a high stake in Constantinople, to say, well, look at at all that you impaled, and so this is what you get. Um, this um there is a street specifically of Constantinople um that is in the Galata quarter and it's called Bancal Arcadesi that um the um, that where Vlad's head would have been in fact exposed like not even in say across the, the golden horn um because of course his head was not worth it even to be properly in Constantinople. Uh, there are legions again about all this um, where Vlad's head circulated uh, etc. There is this idea that uh, it's it's just legion really it's peasant folk tradition that Vlad's uh, let's say the rest of Vlad's body was found in the marshes of Snagov and that it was buried by some monks in the nearby monastery. Um, the truth is that nobody knows where Vlad's body was thrown or buried. Um, there is uh, this sense again that the, the monastery of Snagov was the, the actual place of burial. Uh, in fact, you can't find the actual tomb except that um, this was researched and there was nothing in it. Right, so it's this popular tradition was formed mostly in the 19th century in the age of nationalism and what they found under the tomb was actually just a lot of bones and jaws of horses um, which you know it you see how the, the the circumstances the sort of the dark legion of this individual the fact his body was never found like you can understand how the vampire idea was fabricated later on the devilish connection this guy lost into the hell of war, really. Um, the most likely uh, scenario is that if Vlad uh, was buried anywhere, it was in the first church of the Komana Monastery, uh, close to Giurgiu. Uh So this uh, was, by the way, near to the battlefield, where he would have been killed so 
it could make sense except today there is not there is no burial so we do not know exactly what happened in areas that were ruled by the ottomans eventually for centuries and so um the you know the picture is more grim than of course tradition would like uh, to make us believe but um does it matter really i mean such a great figure historically beyond say everybody knows dracula and vampires but what about actually vlad the third boy vote of balakia uh, uh history like that's that's quite a figure and uh, a man that definitely displayed uncommon qualities uh and that uh, i think rightfully deserves uh Ironically, through just a uh, piece of 19th century literature, but still the, the notoriety that many other leaders of the same kind, like many other that lived uh, at that time, have seen great names here, from Uniadi to uh, Stephen the Great, from Matthias Corvinus um, to, 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 to the very blood Tsepes, um, that, uh, however, were not uh, lucky like Latter, right, in popularization right of, of their exploit um, reason for which uh, I was glad to talk about him naturally we can't talk about him uh, on in other videos too because as you have seen uh, his um, life really was uh, a lot and it intertwined with lots of other stories and places and great figures so we'll surely talk about him at least accidentally but or incidentally say better but we can surely make other videos and uh, you know also in, in the folklore again if you look in the video uh, of, about Balkan heraldry you realize that also the stories of, of vampires of crowds of discotonic monstrous figures were pretty much alive in the folklore of these countries I mean if you look at I know vampirism is a, is a big deal in this world, especially in Serbia, in Romania, also in Eastern Europe. I mean, um, there is really a lot we could recover from this uh, um, story just as a sort of a trigger regarding the traditional meaning of vampirism, etc. That would be interesting. And again, I'm, I've been thinking about it for a while because, again, uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula is one of my favorite pieces of literature. Uh, I I watched, of course, all the movies. Uh, the best one is Morton House, right? A masterpiece of you know, but of um, in fact, dump um, cinema. I don't know how you you call that without audio, but very beautiful is actually. And this is rare that uh, at least the the nineteen ninety, which was. 92 Coppola's one right that is also somehow paradoxically even though it transforms from Bram Stoker's horrid monster Dracula into a sort of tragic hero is actually the most accurate uh, as far as the the book goes um, and it, it has some very beautiful uh, insights and sort of it is one of the best artistic renditions that I've ever seen in a movie uh, of a book and, and beyond and there is especially the initial story that is very again it's just added for the sake of of, of the plot but that sense of you know uh, I don't know the the the, the cross uh, over Aja Sophia just falling with the smoke of the sack you know of, of the Ottomans right rising up uh, and smashing on the ground and looking at uh, Dracula leaving his wife well you know the gates open and there is this, in this gloomy uh, Valachia uh, uh, they're in Transylvania actually in the movie because it follows uh, Bram Stoker's mistake they, um, all these soldiers you know chanting uh, their battle cries uh, you know saluting their leader it is very powerful and if you want to think say of, of a historical you know uh, through historical imagination it, uh, that is pretty evoking and I, I like to think that it was something like that aside of, of course from the from the reality that was 
very very different from which we can even imagine but that is really fascinating and I think I could express a little bit through um, Dracula's story uh, today however I also stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content as always I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye